I think the real secret to building these kind of platforms is really, really pursuing simplicity. That's the hardest part. Like I would honestly say uh, coming up with like ideas and, and all the strategies and stuff like that is, is the easy part, but also, but being able to condense it down for simplicity purposes is the hard part. I Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Robbie Wade, an Australian entrepreneur based in the US. He was introduced to me by Stephen Keery, who I interviewed in episode 65 about how to diversify your wealth into real estate after you have a big exit from your company. He took a company public on the Australian Stock Exchange. So if you want to know more about his uh, former company, what he's doing now, and how you can diversify your portfolio, definitely go take a look at that. So Stephen has uh, invested in Robbie's company, which I'll just mention real fast. So Robbie is the C CEO and co-founder of this app, an all-in-one chat platform that's on a mission to reinvent social communication. You were the uh, you were formerly the CEO of Vid, a blockchain-based social media app, and co-founder of Nebula Ventures, a seed stage venture studio focused on fintech. The reason why I decided to interview you is because. Funny enough, you're building what I was trying to build four years ago, <laughs> also in blockchain. And I just thought it was hilarious because I didn't think anyone had the balls to try it after I, especially after I pivoted away from it. Um, and so even though we still kind of have an adjacent business where I do have a personal messaging side to my team collaboration platform, uh, I just thought it would be hilarious to talk about communication in as uh, you know in general. So, uh, welcome to the show, and yeah, it's nice to have you here. And uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about this app? Thanks, Sean. Uh, I really appreciate it. I just want to touch on something that you mentioned in the uh, bio. I was the COO of Vid, not CEO. I know that you you just skipped over it, but I just want to pay homage to that CEO because that I, I know how hard that job is, and that wasn't me. Um, I, I was the COO, but that's okay. I um. Yeah, I agree. I really am looking forward to having this conversation with you just from your experience in China. Uh, have drawn a lot of inspiration from WeChat, um, which sort of led us on the mission to build this app. And yeah, I mean, we've had the similar funny looks that you might have had when you take on such a, a bold mission. But I think, you know, what's been really cool is we've built up so much momentum now where it's almost harder to stop than it is to keep going in that sense. You know, at the start, it's hard and you, everybody's questioning you as to whether you can get it done or not. And you just have those small wins over and over again and, you know, raise that first check, get those first couple of team members and, and whatnot as, as you would have experienced. Um, but yeah, there's, there's many different things we can discuss there. In terms of really just thinking about this app, I'll try to keep it really, really simple. Uh, so it, we're essentially building a chat platform with three new tools. So the first one being a calendar. Um, that makes it really easy to organize anything, whether it's like a phone call or all the way up to a 30-day 30, 30 trip in Europe. Um, so our goal here is to really build, like I guess you'd say, an intimate version of Facebook events where like fill the space where Facebook events or Eventbrite would be an overkill. Um, the second is a decentralized wallet, that, but a wallet that also keeps track of sort of who owes who. So you've kind of got like a Venmo mixed with a Splitwise um, in, in that sense. So you can keep a tab uh, running and then just transfer money to each other whenever whenever need. Um, and then the inspiration from WeChat um, has where we brought in the sort of collaborative booking. So whilst you're creating these events and trips, you'll be able to book hotels, book restaurants, book tickets and flights and, and all of these kind of wonderful things. So a really sort of encompassing chat platform. But the, the key to everything that we're doing is all of these feature sets tie back into and strengthen the chat. So when I first saw it, I thought it was very clever, honestly. So the I don't know if I told you this on our original call, but what what I was trying to do with Sidekick before it became Nerve was something very similar, except the events and the calendar weren't really part of it. Mm -hmm. Instead, we had a to-do list that could be shared between individuals. Yeah. Um, we had a task, uh, sorry, we had a, um, a file manager that could be shared between people and we had, um, the, the wallet of course. And then we deeper on uh, more into that. We were thinking about, um, doing things where the wallet could add value. 
so like if you wanted to do um like a survey right you could potentially put your crypto you know into the system and pay to like send out a survey to a segment of the user base or even to your own group your own community and people would answer so let's say for example you wanted to put out a new product and you could say mm -hmm. i'm going to put ten thousand dollars into sidekick and I want, uh, I want Sidekick to find people who will answer this question, do you want to buy this product or whatever? And the people will get paid to answer yes or no and maybe yes. give a fee feedback or something. So like there was all sorts of like feedback, you know, surveys, polls. Like, um, So basically I tried to think of what are all of the different ways that I can make it valuable that people will put money in and people can earn money out where the difference between other blockchain companies in the past were we're going to have a blockchain it's going to create coins and everybody's going to get rich. And, and my thought process was, I'm sorry, but that's absolutely fucking stupid. No blockchain is going to create value out of fucking thin air and everybody's going to get rich. You need people to put money in so that people can earn that money from them. That's how an economy works. And so for me, it wasn't about let's have our own blockchain. It was about let's have people attach their Bitcoin wallet, their Ethereum wallet. Let's let people use the coins they have to pay for the things they want and people can earn from them. So, uh, you know, polls were part of it. Surveys were part of it. Um, quizzes, other sort of feedback. Paywalls for groups. Um, you know, there was all sorts of different ways that people could do it. There was, <laughs> we had a hundred screens for a marketplace that I mocked up that I paid for a designer to make. I mean, we were talking about full on physical products and digital products with the marketplace. We, you know, we were insane. I was insane. And my team was like, you're insane, Sean, you're insane. We can't build all of this. We don't have enough money to do it. Yeah. And I think, um, I just to interrupt you there. I think I had a very similar experience. Um, I was just thinking about this, the, uh, you know, over the last couple of days, earlier on, I, you know, some, we had some of our most amazing ideas um, in, in that sense. And you realize what you can and can't do with like certain constraints. I think a beautiful model is the sort of Dunning-Kruger curve, where if, if you know what I'm familiar, you sort of like Dunning-Kruger curve is like you're at the, you're the expert, you know, you think you can do everything. And then you go into like the valley of despair and then you come out in some sense of enlightenment after an enormous amount of work. Um, in that sense. And, you know, as you trek down and you start off as an expert and then as you start doing things, you realize things are a lot harder than what you thought and you end up in the valley of despair and start like, you know, trimming, uh, I guess a good word would be. I think um, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think events is a secret that we, like our sort of secret source and I, I sort of call it our Trojan horse. Um, I think what's important as well is like, the Eastern chat user is very different to the Western chat user, right? And so we kind of have to meet the Western chat user where they already are. A lot of the feature sets that you were talking about and because you've spent time in, in China, like uh, that would be, people would be very used to such sophistication in, in that sense. Whereas, you know, you've got 2 billion people using WhatsApp, which is essentially, you know, text messages, audio messages and video calls. And don't get me wrong, I... I have gained a lot of respect for WhatsApp after building a chat because whilst it looks deceptively simple, it's incredibly reliable. But what I'm saying is you're taking users that that's their sort of capacity and, and expanding beyond that. Um, the other thing as well is like uh, chat's a bit of a sore point in the West uh, in the sense that there's been a lot of distrust. Like, you know, um, if you think about what's weird about chats is, you know, you look at your sort of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, like uh, these sort of leaders of these technology companies that people look up to and are, are admired by, chats have the biggest user bases on the world. And if you ask the average person who was the CEO of WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, Signal or whatever, they couldn't tell you. They, these, these companies aren't really brands. They're kind of just like app tiles on your phone, which is really weird to me, um, given how fundamental they are in terms of our lives. Um, but where I think events is the secret is as I said, like chat's a sore point and it's not that interesting to people anymore. They've already moved from WhatsApp to Signal and whatnot. And, you know, when WeChat came out, it was really interesting. And WeChat's sort of secret source was they introduced audio messages because a lot of Chinese people found the keyboard quite hard to use. And so that's why audio messages sort of took off in the East much more than they did in the West. But now chat's not that interesting. You can't just come out and say, hey, everyone, I got a chat. And like no one cares, like in that sense. And so for us, I was like, you know, what are people doing in chats? They're communicating, 
but they're also organizing, right? And But the thing is, there's no organizational feature sets in chat, zero. Uh, people are just posting text messages of the event details and putting uh, big messages about trips and all, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, tr trying to remember to call each other and saying, hey, when are you free? Hey, when are you free? Hey, when are you free? Hey, call me on Friday. And, and all these kind of things that there's a lot of, um, uh, I guess, just in inefficiency in chat because there's no organizational features. But once you start to open that door to organizational feature sets, there's a world of revenue generating opportunity. And you can start quite simply by just allowing people to create an event in the chat. It goes to their Google or Outlook calendar. And then when it comes to creating a trip, it's literally just like a folder of events. That's all it is. And so it, it's, it's very easy for us to naturally go from events to trips. So that's kind of where I see events being that Trojan horse, as, as you mentioned. The other beautiful thing about events is they have a really cool like growth loop in the sense that, you know, someone creates an event or a trip, usually they're going with four, five, six people and, and whatnot. So it allows you to kickstart that sort of viral coefficient and get the platform growing. I think I had thought of events, but I think it was like on the bottom of my list of things. But I, before I go more into that, I want to touch upon what you were talking about um, with the East versus West. Yeah, so yes, I was one of the first users of WeChat, I think in 2010 or early 2011. I can't remember okay. exactly. It was around there that they came out. It was like within two years of like smartphones coming out because smartphones really didn't hit China the way they hit America. It took like an, another year, year and a half because of the way yeah. that their society was. Um, what a lot of people don't realize about China is they had desktops, and they kind of leapfrogged laptops into smartphones. Yeah. Where laptops were a thing in the West for like a while before smartphones came out. So China had these like really, really simple bar phones and desktops. And then all of a sudden, like a year later, oh, here's a smartphone. And it was from HTC, actually, I think was my first smartphone. I don't know if HTC is still a thing now, but... Um, so there I were very Nokia came out with the phone the other day. So you never know. People might Phoenix is arising from the ashes, I guess. I thought Nokia died. <laughs> <laughs> so what was interesting for me about WeChat was something they came out with actually pretty early on was translation on the fly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where I've told this story a few times before so when i first got to china in 2008 before smartphones existed like trying to learn chinese was very hard because you literally like the, if i had a bar phone like i i brought a phone from america the phone didn't support chinese keyboard it was like yeah. a nokia bar phone how are yeah. you supposed to type in chinese to people by sms like no i had to buy a phone in china to do that but it sucked it was horrible those smartphone keyboards made it so much easier to do. But then the ability to translate on the fly by pressing a button inside of your chat from Chinese to English was a freaking lifesaver because at the time they banned Google. So you had no way to translate. Like there's literally no other application on the planet that you could translate from. And if you didn't know what they said, what they were saying, and you didn't have someone with you who could tell you like, you're literally stuck. Yeah. So they found it to be a very useful tool in improving my Chinese very quickly. And again, this is like 2010, 2011. So, and then the voice messages again was, was a really cool thing. Um, Which so actually re released voice messages three years before iMessage, like just to give an idea of like how fast they shipped product. Uh, in their messaging suite, like iMessage voice messages came three years later. That's a, that's quite a long time. Um, when you think about it, I think this happened because the founders of WeChat were the founders of QQ, yeah. which was like a desktop messenger on in China. So I think because they already had like a decade of experience with communication, for them, switching to smartphone was like a no-brainer. And I think there's actually an origin story for this. Um, it's not well known. I, I think I read about it a few years ago, but they were like, 
they kind of hit on it. It was like this kind of Eureka thing. And they're like, holy crap, we need to put all of our resources into this smartphone thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was very well played because I think in 2020, they did like, like $10 billion in profit or something. I don't know. Yeah, their, their, their revenue per user is astronomical. And the, the cool thing about WeChat is they feature facilitate um, revenue generation. Like it's only about 10 to 15% of their sort of revenue pie is advertisements. Whereas in the West, you're looking at 98 to 99%, especially in the cases of Facebook and, and whatnot. Um, there's something interesting about what you said um, about the translation and the audio transcription stuff as well uh, that, that WeChat does as in, in that sense. Um, one thing about the West that we all have to be kind of mindful of is there's been this obsession over end-to-end -end encryption, which I, I get the importance of privacy and, and all those kind of things. It's very important. But what we all have to appreciate is that we're, we're giving up an enormous amount of potential feature sets because like audio transcription is really difficult with end-to-end -end encryption. Translating things is really difficult with end-to-end -end encryption. If I can't read your message, it's, it's very hard to translate it um, uh, in, in that sense. So I, I'm sure that there's people coming up with creative ways to be able to do it with end-to-end -end encryp end -to -end encryption and we'll, we'll probably crack that boundary. Um, but I, I do... As much as I do believe in the importance of end-to-end -end encryption, I think at the same time, it's a band-aid fix for companies that we don't trust uh, in, in that sense. And so I, I think we need to figure out our relationship with that because it's impacting the quality of the products that we're, we're using. Like if you look at a lot of the feature sets that have come out in different messengers over the last like, th since like video calling, we've had like stickers, um, emojis, things that light on fire, boxes that open, all this kind right. of stuff. And you, Completely useless as far as I'm concerned. You know, compared to like WeChat, like I think people sort of underestimate what a super app is. Like a super app isn't just a a, a product that's multifunctional. Like it, it, does, it has multiple features. Like uh, su uh, WeChat's kind of like multiple platforms, right? It's like, I, it's I'll, like YouTube, I'll, Instagram, like and all of that kind of stuff in one. I can give you a, a good description of it. I, I, I can I can help you to expand because I've lived it. Let's say you wake up and you get a message about a new job. That message is on WeChat. Yeah. Let's say you want to call about the job information. You call on WeChat. Okay. The person says, hey, I'm going to send you 100 RMBs, about $15. Come get a taxi over here. And we'll do an interview. Well, guess what? They're going to send you that 100 RMB in your digital wallet on WeChat. It'll get to you seconds after they tell you they're going to send it, assuming they send it on time. You're then going to use that money to hail a taxi inside of WeChat to get to that location using a map that's inside of WeChat. Mm -hmm. And then when the interview is over and they say, okay, fine, we're going to hire you, whatever. And you say, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to go for a meal. You're going to hail another taxi using the additional money left over from WeChat in WeChat using the WeChat map to tell the driver, you know, where you're going to eat. And then when you get to the restaurant, you're going to load the menu in WeChat. And then when you're done with the meal, you're going to pay for the meal using the WeChat wallet. Like, and then you decide... I need to go home and see my parents for the weekend. So you book a train on WeChat, right? And then you send your parents a message on WeChat telling them you're coming home for the weekend. Like people live in WeChat. It sounds that's, like another world. when you, That is a super app. That is a super it app. It sounds like another world when you think about it. Like the closest, there's a couple we do have in the West. Like, you know, you could argue that Instagram's a little bit of a, but I'd call them more multifunctional platforms because they're in one sort of category. Like Instagram has, you know, fashion and art photos, and then you can buy those products. Like it's it's just an extension rather than like a multi-platform approach, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Oh, it, I didn't it's, even it's get a, into that. It, I, I'd, I'd almost call it like an iteration, like in that sense. And like on, I, I, I'm in New York, as I said at the moment, and I was on Uber last night and I was like, oh, cool. Like you can do like, pick up where I could just see the restaurants around me and then look through their menus. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's awesome. But it's such a, it's 2022. Like, why is that a, why is that a exciting feature for me? Like in that sense, I was like, you know, 
Um, and and but it, it's just because that sort of inno innovation friction. But then there's been other areas where there's been serious innovation. But I think you know we've we've kind of I, I guess a good word is we've got complacent in chat, right? Like I. I, I just definitely think there is such a space. And as you said, you have to be insane to uh, consider innovating in this space because you're going up against companies that have more money than most govern governments and have the bit, the largest user bases in the world. Like I heard someone say, <laughs> Facebook has more users than Christianity. And when you just let that sit for a second and they've, they've achieved that in a decade, uh, that's a remarkable thing. Um, in, in that sense. So I think the sort of absence of innovation um, is the result of, I guess, how bold the mission is. But also I think we have this sort of mentality in the West where it's been like this sort of lean startup approach where it's like pick a niche, monopolize in that one little thing, and then one of these big companies will come and buy you and put, put you on their Lego block. But really what they're doing is they're just going to buy your team and swallow you into their sort of like universe um, in that sense. So I, I, I would like, you know, I, I think we're in shortage of bold visions in that way. And I think Chad is, Chad is a deceptively, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's such an important product that everyone's almost forgotten about. Well, call me bold because four years ago, I wanted to put paywalls on a personal messenger. <laughs> like if you look at if you look at slack you were early. that's like a discord like kind of telegram is doing a lot of that stuff now if you look at slack you look at discord you look at whatsapp you look at all of these companies that have the potential to put a paywall on a group or on a community and didn't is a hundred percent not even wechat does it so four years ago i said that's going to be one of my defining features i'm going to let people charge to join their group and it's going to happen inside of the app they're not going to go to a patreon they're not going to go to a paypal they're not going to use a launch pass whatever alternatives no bots whatever we're going to build it natively and we're going to take a freaking cut but we're not going to take 30 percent. we'll take five percent why because we want people mm -hmm. to actually use it why do and you think no one's done it what, what would be your hypothesis i have no clue but it's a freaking masterpiece it boggles my mind. You look at Discord. What did they do? They let you pay Discord to like have stickers and profile banners. Like, <laughs> are you freaking insane? Why don't you let people pay to join a server? Like, I'm trying to work this out on my own Discord server right now for my own community that I'm building. And I and have to use like, a, bot. a bot and do all this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like, why, why doesn't discord let me charge telegram? Why don't you let me charge? Nobody has a freaking wallet. And the only company that has a wallet doesn't support it. It, I think we WeChat think has lost out on billions upon billions upon billions in revenue by allowing people to join a paid freaking group. Do you think maybe it's got to do with, uh, international, payments because like you know whatsapp hasn't even nailed payments internationally between different users and i think crypto can bridge that gap in some capacities um but none of the chat apps have actually nailed payments at a global level like you can send messages globally but you can't send payments globally um i definitely think that's the next frontier whoever cracks that hopefully us um that'll be you know the next sort of huge evolution from being able remember when you know calling internationally or messaging internationally was a financial decision like you'd be like oh shit do i have enough it's money still, to call my friend in america um it still in is. Sense, what do you mean i sometimes i pay like a dollar to call singapore per minute oh really yeah okay well when you use like whatsapp and stuff like you can call people in europe or america or australia or whatever maybe like you know depending on certain countries but in, in a lot of cases, video calling is free. You and I can have this podcast. You're in Europe. I'm in the, America. This isn't free, though. I'm paying $50 a month to be able to record. <laughs> software. That's, a, that's like recording software. But, I mean, the, we could right. do a Zoom call for free, right? Um, the uh, But my, my point here is, like, do you think that these gates have been challenging because you have users from heaps of different countries with different currencies and to be able to accept all of those currencies so that you can have people enter the chat no matter where they are. I, I That's the only thing that I could think of in terms of why it would be challenging. 
Well, I know India's had a problem, and I think Brazil's had a problem with WhatsApp doing payments. Yeah. I, I think it's a political thing because mm. let's say someone's in like Iran and they want to join you, but you're an American group or like the group is an American owner. Are you allowed to take money from an Iranian? You know, well, this, if, this is like the sort of the anti money laundering kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's political more than anything else. Absolutely. But, and, and so like WeChat, they're stuck using RMB. Why? They're a Chinese company. They don't yeah. want their citizens taking money out of the country and they make it but very difficult like billion, to do. You have a billion people in sort of like a microchasm, if that makes sense. Like that's an enormous user base that you can uh, just own in that sense. I, I know. I mean, speaking outside of that specific situation, I can't tell you how many people, I mean, hundreds at least have told me I'm going to go to China and I'm going to make a lot of money because there's a billion people. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> good luck with that shit. I've been there. I tried. Yeah. It's not easy. The chances yeah. of success are under 1% as but a foreigner. Even once you're there, it's hard. Like you look at, you know, the, the situation with Jack Maher and, and, and all those kind of things. It's a, it's a different ball game when you're playing. Well, um, it, it is, but if you look at like, um, there's only real, so there, there's a lot of companies that have tried to go into China and a lot of them fail. So for example, I think it was Uber, Uber spent like, I think a billion dollars or a billion dollars a month. They spent a, an exorbitant amount of money trying to get the Chinese market. And in the end they sold their stake or they, they sold their local operations to Didi, which is a local Uber. Yeah. And they ended up owning part of Uber uh, opening. Uh, they ended up owning part of Didi, which is good for them because Didi's freaking grown, fantastic. But, um, but they failed, and they failed in Malaysia. And Grab ended up purchasing their stake in in Malaysia. So like, Uber has tried to, in multiple markets in Southeast Asia, and they just have no concept of how to to do it. And and what's Grab doing? Grab's doing a super app in like a car hailing thing. So yeah, they're they're taking a WeChat approach, but with no communications inside. I have um, a little bit of skepticism there. I uh, I think that's also political in in a way. Like I, DD, I'm pretty sure uh, WeChat has a large stake in DD. Um, you know, there's big organizations that have large stakes in WeChat. I, I think it's you know, I, I think that given the opportunity, Uber could have figured it out. And and when you look at Grab's investor base, it's it's quite uh, heavy as well. When 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 you look at that, and I I think they just had the right partnerships but i mean it all does come down to execution in the end um but i, I think that uh uber was fighting a lost fight uh in, in that i don't think that they could of course regardless of what they did they, it, it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna win it, it, given that there was a um a domestic option that you know everybody could back uh you know there, there, there's a little bit of nationalism that comes off the back of that um, but yeah, no, I think for us, I have tried not to focus too much. Like I have been inspired by WeChat in from like a business model perspective, because I think feature facilitating revenue is something that's underrated in the West. Like our, our sort of business models are kind of either advertisement or subscription and, and that's kind of it. Um, but I think the real secret to building these kind of platforms is really really pursuing simplicity that's the hardest part like i would honestly say uh, coming up with like ideas and and all the strategies and stuff like that is is the easy part but also but being able to condense it down for simplicity purposes is the hard part i i sort of like this analogy it's just, i don't know if it's actually true but the story between like the russians and americans in the space race and even though like the americans made it first the americans spent heaps of money and time making like a space pen and the Russians just used a pencil um, <laughs> in that sense. And you, you sort of just got to try to think about these things. And like, I think about this a lot with product development because we only have like limited resources and stuff. Oftentimes you find that uh, you're trying so hard that you're actually the blocker. Like in that sense, um, if you think of like a river and if a river is blocked, you, you need to like unblock it. You don't really need to push more forced force into the river. Um, I think sometimes product development's the same. Like you can achieve so much more by removing feature sets and and simplifying. Uh, I, I I sort of tie it to if you think about like weightlifting. When you remove the weight, you you're pursuing power. Like in that sense, uh, and and I think 
it's something that's so undervalued. And when you're pursuing such a big vision, it's it's romantic to be able to do everything and serve your users in every single capacity that you can ever think of in your mind. And look, over 20 years, I, I need something to do for the next 20 years, right? So you don't want to have all your features at once and you, you slowly want to grow and learn from your users, but you want to tailor it to them. Like if you build the juggernaut and, and give them the, you know, the, the perfect, um, the perfect product, like it's not theirs. They didn't build it with you. They didn't come on the journey with you. They didn't grow through the evolution. They didn't complain about things and you fix them and, and all that. And I, I think that part's underrated. Like one thing that annoys me, for example, with Apple is like their AirPods. I don't know if you, you, you wear AirPods, but like when you, when you're having a conversation with someone, the amount of noise they pick up is just insane. But like, I keep wearing them because I know Apple will fix it. And when they fix it, I'll be so happy about it in, in that it's just a, a relationship that I have with them. If that makes sense, they'll fix it and charge you $5,000 to do so. So <laughs> yeah. these are $300 from yeah. Bose and I hear nothing. I have no I environmental have noise whatsoever. Pair. They're like heaps comfy on your ears, right? They're very comfortable. I wear them everywhere yeah. I go. I was introduced to them about probably six years ago. I was in a hotel room with a friend of mine and he was, he was on the bed next to me working on his laptop. And I looked at him and I was like, Hey, Alfred, what do you want for dinner? And he's sitting there typing away. I was like, Hey, Alfred, what do you want for dinner? Sitting there typing away. It's like, Hey, Alfred. What and I've waved at him and he's like, Oh, what? He's like, what do you want to do for dinner? Like that's, that's how it is. It's just so incredible. Yeah. You literally can't hear anything. You're on trains, you're on planes, you're in noisy buses, you're trying to get work done in a co-working space where everyone's talking on their phones, whatever. You can't hear anything. Yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, a chat app can't fix that. <laughs> so <laughs> no, I, but I, want I, I think it's a, it's just a, uh, a good analogy for just, just keep things simple and grow your product with your users. Like, I, I do like looking at WeChat, but sometimes it, it sends me down the wrong path. Like you need to sort of stay mm. true to what you know about your users and different countries operate in different ways and, and, and all those kind of things. And so, um, yeah, so for me, it, it's it's more been a inspiration rather than like a direct influence um, in, in that sense to, to really think about that. But I think it's a it's a good tie. For sure. I want to just touch back on uh, your original question about why um, things didn't kick off with the payments inside of apps, because um, I kind of only half really answered that. Okay, so the, sure. uh, the thing that I was going to, or the, the final aspect of my answer was going to be, I think um, fiat currencies are the problem. I think cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. are the solution for it. And that's why I wanted to build something with a cryptocurrency based wallet in it, because I thought that it would enable instantly anyone from anywhere to pay anyone for anything at any time. And no one could tell them they couldn't. Yeah. And I was going to sit there and happily take a little cut. I think it makes sense. Like I, I've studied information theory a fair bit. And when you look back at uh, the history of like the telegram, the telephone, all of these kind of things, um, people had similar fears with sort of like not anti-money laundering, but like communicative terrorism, like in that sense, like if we let the people talk to each other freely, then they're going to rise up against the government. And, you know, if you think about before chats, you had to like go to the post office and like ask for permission to send a letter to your friend and like all these kind of things. And I know it sounds detached, but it's not really like in, in that sense, and the internet allowed us to create information and send it wherever we wanted before you had to get a newspaper to approve you to make a journal article or a blog or something, or you had to get someone to print you in your magazine and, and, and whatnot before you could go out saying things. And I think finance will have its time. It will be harder to do. There's, there's more... Uh, there's more nuances with money than there is with information in terms of, you know, money can... It, it's one thing to organize, um, you know, a terrorist, let's just use terrorism for an example. It's one thing to organize a terrorist activity in a chat and you're messaging each other. And it's another thing for someone to sponsor it with, you know, half a million or a million dollars, right? They're, they're, it's an order of magnitude in terms of the difference 
that occurs there. So we just need to solve those problems, but um, there's incredibly smart people working on I, it, and I agree with I you. I don't um, think you can solve that. Look, the, no, you, you, the only you way can. you can solve that is if you don't have encrypted chat so you can see what everyone's saying. Yeah, I mean, the way the way we solve it is, like, I, I would say it's it's multifunctional, right? Like, you, what this, the state that cryptocurrencies is in right now, I don't think it's going to be the state that it sort of ends up in. Um, I think people always opt for encryption in some capacity, like what you were saying, like if you research like the telegram or the telephone or whatnot, people used to like create codes to send their their messages in so the people in like the transmission tower didn't read their messages and whatever. So like people have been doing it since the dawn of time and, you know, people have been in the underground transferring money. I, I think, you know, at a whole there's 7 billion, if you round it down, there's 7 billion good people in the world or 8 billion good people in the world when you when you sort of round it down. What was that? I can't hear you. I don't know if it's my... It Sorry, no, my, I, I, no, no, I was good. muted by accident. Um, I was going to say probably closer to 8 because China doesn't publish its numbers properly and India probably doesn't know exactly what their numbers are. Well, yeah, and, and I think these, these things... Um, these things are bound to happen. And this is something that I think about just going back to product development. Sometimes we sort of over engineer for the worst case scenario as well. Like if you think about it, like if you were to, if you were to look at a restaurant, right. And you were like, okay, we need to put all the, all the guests in cages so they don't stab each other with a knife or something like that. Like, do, do you get what I mean? Like if you had, if you looked at all the risks that were involved or if you think about like people driving, like imagine sitting down with the product team of, um, putting the average person in a car on the road and you'd be like, oh my God, they're going to drive over people. They're going to crash into houses. They're going to do all these things. And, you know, we, we, we think about you would have this problem when you're thinking through product. And one real example that I think about a lot is like, imagine if you were the product team that came up with forwarding and sharing, you'd be like, oh my God, like people are going to send my shirtless photos and they're going to send my bank details and they're going to share this under Facebook, but forwarding and sharing are two of the most important features on like in social communication that exists today and without them it would be an enormous amount of friction to be able to get things done so i i think we also just have to become more trusting and optimistic in these scenarios and there is good like the law of big numbers things are going to go wrong and that's going to suck but i don't think that we should make everybody suffer because of you know a minor few we actually thought about forward and forwarding and replying mm -hmm. and because we have a business use case we were thinking about well because we're we've got this team side and we've got this individual side and so we were trying to think about you know should people should we default to you can't send information from a team to the outside and uh -huh. you know so like there, there's a lot of complexity just in privacy and what do we default to? Do we default to you could do it for everybody? You could do it for nobody? Does this does the team have a company policy that prevents anyone from sending information outside? It's like it it's a very, very complicated feature. But the reality is you can do it anyway. Like if I wanted to screenshot it or copy and paste it or download it and send it, like I can do it anyway. So there's if if I want to do it, I can. So there's no point restricting me, right? Yes. But if you do that and your company finds out and they have a policy against it, then you could lose your job. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what you guys have feature wise, the company is going to have its own policies, right? So like well, to make your easier, the user can do it anyway, regardless of if you build this completely elaborate, see, and I don't know what feature, like I haven't seen your product. So I'm just talking from my very limited knowledge of right. what you're doing in that sense. Um, but if the user can pack it together, like if they wanted to share company information and they can copy and paste it or they can screenshot it, if they want to, they can do it, right? So like what would be the advantage of feature stopping them in, in that sense when they could just bypass that and do it their own way? In the, For the sake of privacy. So uh, the, the way that I try to think of things is how can we create frameworks, you know, that companies that can then turn into policies in a simple okay. way, because okay. if, if we make a feature and then 
the company can decide to disable it, then if somebody does a screenshot, if somebody does this, whatever, don't look at me. I let yeah. you decide to can't, you know, to stop it. If it happens anyways, don't look at me. I, I have nothing to do with it. Right. So a lot of, a lot of companies try to, a lot of companies like Facebook are like, oh, pff, I didn't upload this content. Why should I have to moderate it? Right. It's not my fault. So the way I think of it is if you create features that are open-ended and you give the people the responsibility for determining what they want to do with it, I've done my job. I'm protecting myself and my shareholders and my mm -hmm. team. That's all I can do. I have to yeah. provide the feature, but you determine yeah. if you want to use it. Yeah. It's an interesting one. Like I permissions is, you know, you would know this being a founder uh, of a consumer product permissions is a endless, endless, endless wormhole. You could be like, yeah, but if the user is creating an event and it's in a trip, but they're not in the group, but they're, but they are an admin of the trip, but it's a different admin of the group. Can that admin delete them? And you can like, you know, tie your own shoelaces together, trying to like figure it out. Um, my, when, when my, CTO, my CTO hates me for introducing permissions too early. We have like, yeah. I think, I think we have 25 different permissions already for the team yeah. side. And he's like, you do realize how annoying this is, right? He's like, we should have launched without permissions and then added them later. They just have so many edge cases, but they're important, right? Like it, it, it's, you have this fine balance where you've just got to try to figure it out and you guys are going more down like a B2B enterprise road from what I understand. Um, so permissions, uh, you know, you can be a little bit looser on permissions in consumer than you can uh, enterprise for sure. So that's, that's something that you have to consider and you obviously have. Um, tell me just quickly, what are you thinking about if you can share what's what's your concept of this sort of like team versus personal thing like a are, are there, is it are you mixing like a slack and a whatsapp or is that kind of what you mean yes okay cool so the way that we look at it is if you look at slack you create a space for your team and your identity is tied to that space okay. if you want to join multiple spaces you're essentially using the same identity for every space you go to. Mm -hmm. It's not correct. Because let's say I use my at getnerve.io email. Do you for, mean within your, like, like every channel you go to? Or do you mean if you go to a separate Slack? If you go to a separate Slack, basically you're... So it, it, it really depends, right? If you're a user, you can go between different spaces, but you have different emails and you have different passwords and you have to remember yes. which one it is. Yeah. Stupid. Absolutely stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what we decided to do was now, again, we have the benefit of this knowledge because the architecture we're using for our B2B plat platform is actually our original sidekick architecture, which was an end user messaging platform, which is the okay. user creates their own account. So when yeah. we made the pivot, we kept the entire architecture. And as a result, we had the benefit of being able to start from the point of view of the individual user who may be part of multiple teams. Which most people are like, but it's not only just teams that are on Slack, people are in like communities and masterminds exactly. and all this kind of stuff. It's not people with multiple jobs per se. Right. The, the problem with Slack still is if I'm in 20 different spaces, which I'm sure a lot of people are even five or 10, how do you remember all of the emails and password combinations you're using for all of them if you have multiple ones? And, and also there's this lack of seamlessness between logins. So I might be mm -hmm. logged in on Slack on my phone and I may be in three different spaces, but if I log on on my computer, I may be on 10. Yeah. So what we did was we said the user is going to create an account. They can join a space. They can create a space. They can join a group. They can create a group. They can have private chats where they, you know, they can add people as contacts. You can search globally like LinkedIn. We have a profile system so that you can, um, yeah. you know, show off your, your CV basically, you know? So basically we have a LinkedIn, we have a, a WhatsApp, whatever, and we've got a Slack. We put them all together in a seamless way as the, our MVP. So it's focused on the user and there's one account for all of it. So you're almost like the, the Western version of WeChat work, right? Or what, the, the work version of WeChat. 
Yes, but I wasn't inspired by WeChat. Say so similar in in yeah yeah. I was inspired by the fact that there is no freaking platform for business professionals to network and communicate on mm, a per yeah. on a private level. Because if you are in Slack, there is no private communication. There is only what happens inside of a space, and the owner of the space owns your history. And even if you're having what you think is a private chat, they can export the entire history of all of the Very conversations that happened. And if you want to have, that. and it's true, just look up their information. It's in it's in their documentation. No, I know it's true now that you say it. But I was like, the, the DMs on direct messages on Slack on a safe place to chat in theory. So the only way that you as a business professional can have a private conversation is outside of a team space. So mm -hmm. we built a personal messenger with a profile Smart. system, with a contact messaging system, because LinkedIn is a profiling system, but it has shitty chat. The chat, the chat is getting better. My main issue with LinkedIn is the amount of spam because anybody like it's, you go into your LinkedIn inbox and it's just full of junk. Like I probably go on LinkedIn once a week, maybe two weeks. I, I loathe going on it just because it's just full of junk, like in that sense. And uh, that's something I, I've thought about a lot is because I don't want to be like WhatsApp where you can only access your contact book, right? I want to more be able to search for users globally, kind of like you can on Instagram. But how do we make sure that your chat overview stays clean so that it's not full of spam and I can't just message Justin Bieber because I feel like it, right? Like in that sense, you need to get it's like the request privacy. element. So link LinkedIn has LinkedIn has privacy. Well, they've got if, their first, second, third degree connection, yeah. Right. So what we've done is we don't have first, second, third. We have... Who do I know that you also know? Yeah, friends of that's friends. That's it. That, that's it. So yeah. then based on privacy, you decide, do I want everyone to be able to message me? Do I want friends of friends to be able to message me? Do I want friends to be able to message me? Do I want nobody to be able to message me? Yeah. So when you come up with this kind of profiling system, you've got strangers, you've got people who are pending, you have people you're connected to, you have people who are connected to the people that you know. And then you make determinations about who's going to message me, who's going to call me, who can add me to a group, simple things, you know, so that way, <laughs> exactly that way, Justin Bieber doesn't get bombarded by strangers, but you still have this beautiful profiling system that's useful and functional so that you can uh, see information from people if they allow you to see it like LinkedIn has. And it's attached yeah. to your contact manager and your personal manager. And you can have these simple groups for quick chats or simple communities. And if you want something more robust, like a discord, you create a team space. It's just the, like, um, when I think about it, uh, at a scaled level, like it always makes sense. Like the, this is the other problem sometimes with permissions and, and the privacy stuff is like, I, I like Elon Musk's kind of framework of thinking where he says, like, think of things at their limits right? Like, what does it look like when there's a billion people? What does it look like when there's zero, right? And so when there is zero or a hundred or a thousand, friends of friends is very limited, right? Because you don't have a lot of friends on there. It's not, it, it, it hasn't reached the scale of Instagram and Facebook and, and whatnot. And so like that, that's the gap that I'm aware that I'm really trying to think of bridging. Like, how do you like friends of friends, like the, the sort of degrees of separation uh, becomes more useful uh, you know, someone's three or four degrees away from me or whatever, it, it becomes possible as you scale. Um, but, but low numbers make it quite challenging. So that's where you need to tr like maybe swap for their contact book or some other strategy where you can figure out how you can still maintain that user's privacy in the early days. And then, you know, at the same time in the early yeah. days, it probably doesn't matter because Justin Bieber is probably not on your platform anyway. Um, like in that sense. So it's a, it's a catch 22, but at the same time, bots are always hunting your platform down in the early days. So you don't want bots to be able to fill someone's chat overview, but you want them to be able to message their friends. And so just trying to solve those problems, which we both have to tackle on a daily basis. I made the determination long ago that even if it was a great way to get a bunch of users on the platform quickly, I would never use the contact book. Because mm -hmm. so what, one of the things that a lot of these apps do is they require your phone number. 
in order to be able yeah. to access the application. And in doing so, they basically take your contact list, whether you like it or not. And yeah. WhatsApp not only does that, you can just be dropped in a group without your permission and everybody can see your phone number. Like I could just drop you in a group of 150 people and they all have your phone number instantly. It's crazy to me. Right. And I don't like groups and I'm not part of groups on WhatsApp. So I made this decision that I wanted user accounts and it would never be tied to a phone number because I don't want to know what your number is. And I'm sure you don't want the government to know what the number is. I mean, this, again, this was when we were thinking about, um, user, you know, uh, uh, end user messaging yeah. At business. It's a different thing, but still I mean, you would never put your phone number into a business app. No way. I think so, phone numbers also have a shorter, a shorter l life cycle or time frame than sometimes like email does. Like say, I don't know, my, my, my phone died or, um, I'm in another country and I can't receive a text message or because I, I travel around a lot. The amount of times I've had to reboot my WhatsApp with another phone number and lose all my history over 10 times. Like, and it's, it's the most frustrating thing, but if it was just tied to my email, everything would be okay. So I, I understand that because I travel as well and I do have this problem when I go between different SIM cards. However, I don't lose my chat history on WhatsApp. I, so what I do is I have, I have a backup to Google uh, cloud using my Gmail. Right. And so when I get a new um, phone number, I'll just like download the history back. Huh? For some reason it hasn't worked for me the last few times I've, I've been like cleared out, but anyway, continue with what you were saying. Well, so I do that for Telegram. So for all of my apps, I used to lose all the history for everything and it pissed me off. Yeah. So now I just have it so that it doesn't happen anymore. And it's, yeah. it's really useful for sure. Even though I am pissed off, I have 10 freaking chat apps. It is what it is. Um, so you guys, you guys opted for using email, I'm guessing? We decided to use email, yes. Um, we're actually currently working on testing a feature that would allow you to make multiple emails connected to your single account so yeah. that if you joined the space for your for a team that used one email and you joined another space for another team that used a different email let's say you're you know you work for two different companies or you know let's say you've got a client and that client has decided to give you a domain email for the purposes of working with them you could essentially join that space with that email. And yeah. then you could you could tell us which is the main email you want to receive communication. And so we're not sending emails to every single one of your freaking accounts. Yeah. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. It's like how we can make it easier for you to manage multiple different companies or teams or clients or or whatever with one user account. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's, it's fascinating to think about chat from like a, you know, you've gone from consumer mindset all the way through to enterprise mindset. We've stayed very, like, very much on the on the consumer side, and I, I've really it's been a it's been a dance for me because like uh, the the target user that I'm looking at is the average WhatsApp user. So you know, you've 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 got to educate them in a number of different feature sets as you sort of expand out. So trying to expand features whilst maintaining familiarity and simplicity is something that we've gone for. Like familiar UI with a new UX is kind of like our, uh, our, our strategy in that sense. But I, it's, it's interesting to hear how we have like similar challenges in, in, in that sense, like, <laughs> especially when it comes down to like permissions and edge cases. Uh, I love the analogy of sort of tying your shoelaces together. Cause sometimes you do that. You'd be like, you, you discover the perfect UX, you get all the way to the end of it. And then like four weeks later, you're trying to do something and you're like, Oh man, I drove myself down into like a dead end or something like that. Um, I think it's also, and you would probably experience this, I think it's important at a product level as well, and I, I think people don't do this enough, is think of like how an artist like sketches a piece of paper. If you watch like a someone who's good at sketching, they sketch like the bigger picture and you can start to see like the outlines of the product and they do like the sort of like shading and detail last. Uh, in that sense, because the big picture encompasses the small details and the small details don't necessarily encompass the big picture. And I think early on in, in, in businesses, people trap themselves by focusing on like one thing or like focusing on too small of a vision so that when you do, you don't 
your your vision doesn't have the room to expand because you didn't like you didn't sketch it out first as to what it might look like in 10 20 years time and so you know the steps that you could actually take to be able to get there and and i can sort of see that in the way that you're thinking like uh you know you've got this sort of linkedin piece you've got this this individual messaging piece and you've sketched you've sketched around the outsides because you you sort of can see what the user wants to do over 10 years whereas like other people might be like okay i just want to make a chat with channels and and then businesses are going to use it like well, that, uh, but where do you go from there you know that, that's our mvp yeah <laughs> no it's 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 ambitious and you know i mean that means something obviously ca- coming from someone who's taking on an ambitious project in that way and yeah. i uh i definitely um admire what you guys are doing and um can't, can't wait to use it in in terms of our business and and whatnot and it's it's been a fascinating conversation talking to you because you understand uh and i guess yeah i would almost use the word like empathize with the the challenges that we have because you've you've faced them in your own way um in multiple capacities uh we weren't as brave as you to take on blockchain early um we do have a token strategy that we will be uh attacking down the road but I more wanted to be a growth mechanism once the product sort of scaled and hit product market fit, and yeah, we've got a lot more money and 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 whatnot to take on such a bold adventure. And when um, the market is willing to buy into such a a, a plan, which it's not yeah. now, and it probably will be well, another two years. Yeah, I mean, we, we're going into it, the dark ages, and so in that sense, I do um, I do wish you the best of luck in that uh, over the next sort of two years. You and I have definitely got. A hard road ahead of us um you know it, I, i'm sure that we're, we've both got good teams and we're, we're, we're making all the best decisions we can but regardless of what we think we're going into a, a bear market and people's attitudes and uh perspectives change and, and all of those kind of things so we just got to keep our, our heads high and remain optimistic to to get the job done my secret to making good decisions is i tell my coo and then he tells me how bad it is. He gives me a better idea. And then he tells the team and they f- make it even better. Something like that. <laughs> that is a, that is a good, a good path. I, uh, good decisions is an interesting one for us. We have a very sort of like, uh, open culture. Like I sort of say, I'm the captain of the soccer team and I've hired experts around me. I'm, I'm not the best in each of their positions. And, you know, uh, our lead designer will happily challenge me on anything and, if we can agree, usually it's a better result. So rather, I I do everything in my power to not sort of force rank, um, in that sense because uh, taking a little bit longer to find mutual agreement often lands in a better result. Um, yeah. But we have so many different top because we're a remote global team. We have people in different countries, different ages, different personalities who speak different languages. If every single person in the team is like, that's a good idea there's a pretty good chance that it probably is. And it's not a design by consensus. They will always say when it's a bad idea, but there's just so many different personalities. If we can all agree it, it's a, it's a good sign. Yeah, I was kidding by the way, but no, what, what we do is uh, it really depends. Sometimes I'll be the one that has the idea and then I'll just go, Hey, I had this idea and then they'll tear it apart and then they'll come back with something better. Um, it's, <laughs> That's it, the way. It, it, it is quite rare for my original thought to be something that like actually gets into the product. Um, at, <laughs> least, at, at least not anymore, because when I was allowed free reign to do that, I caused a lot of problems. So we had it, to hire be a, a manifestation. Mm-hmm. It'd be a manifestation of you in some capacity. Uh, I, I assume like, I mean, uh, yes, you it's know, just, you're leading the company and you're, it goes through the lens now of what is actually necessary and what mm-hmm. is functional and what adds value rather than every little feature that I think is necessary and useful. So we, we actually have to say, you know, before I was like, oh, this is a good idea. Let's go make it. And now it's like, okay, well, this is a good idea, but maybe it's not necessary for another 18 months. So let's put it in a backlog and let's come back to it, you know, in six months and see. Maybe I think what's it's- useful for that is, uh, is announcing sort of like release dates and launch timeframes. It 
We haven't really, released anything yet. <laughs> it re- it, no, but what I'm saying is like when you set a release date, it really squeezes you. And when you tell everybody you're going to release that day and, and all those kind of things, yes, uh, like you're putting boundaries around yourself, but it forces you to prioritize what matters. Um, in, in that way, you're like, yeah, probably don't need that like pink swirly thing. Um, in that sense. Um, because, you know, as a as an innovator and a creator, you, you have... Uh, innovative thought all the time i think one thing that's undervalued and I, we can end on this uh just just to be conscious of time is never to underestimate your original ideas like in that sense i sort of recently read a business plan that i wrote two years ago and it's pretty close um in that sense and i haven't picked it up and i've heard this a lot from different people who have like written down you know what they wanted to do with their lives and then when they're like 45 years old they find the note in their garage and it's like it's it's pretty close and i, I think without getting like spiritual in that way that's sort of underrated um in the sense like don't forget your original sort of intuition that encouraged you to go on such a bold journey because it must have been deep um in order for you to take on such a ridiculous mission um in that sense and uh, i i yeah and when i look back through our designs that we did early on you know we became better designers but the the concept was there like in, in that sense in in terms of what what needed to be done so i just try to always you know tie back like what what was my original insight and where am i now and how far have i drifted from that and why um is a is an interesting yeah. construct we drifted quite far from my original concept well, you've got a pivot so that's a different no kind of right still communication you've still got individual communication you've still got essences and elements of your original idea that you have even though you've pivoted you've brought your original idea with you for a reason yes however in the past we were building all of those extra features on our own like the 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 different things i mentioned the different pieces and in our pivot we decided to change to something called deep integrations which we're building a framework for where instead of us building a um a file manager or building a task manager or building a communicate uh, um you know like a calling system we're taking the apis of other companies and we're building the ui ux and then integrating them together yeah. so that they make sense inside of each individual chat so it's good to uh, test and then once it works you can build your own later anyway we don't know no, we don't want to the the thing mm-hmm. is what we realized was it's hard enough to get people to use a new messaging system. Yeah. It's even harder to convince them to use other native tools that they're already paying for elsewhere. So kind of like with the original idea where we wanted to have our own blockchain and then we said, screw our own blockchain, let's use the wallets, you know, let's use the tokens that people already have from their existing other platforms. In that regard, that's how we saw, you know, these uh, extra tools and how they integrate into the platform is why should we build it ourselves and maintain it when we can just build integrations from the tools people are already paying for so then it makes it less likely that they're going to him and ha on their way to using our platform for the communication side so instead yeah. of building everything natively let's you know release that responsibility let's focus on creating a ui ux standard for how those platforms integrate into our system then we can manage them and we can build out our own uh we can build we can create those integrations using their APIs for some and others people can make their own and then we can you know review the code and make sure that it fits with our standard and then approve or deny their ability to enter our marketplace. Absolutely. Like I think it uh it loops back around to what I was saying about the space pen and the pencil. When you when you've already got a rocket to build, don't worry about building a space pen, just let people bring their pencils. Um in that sense. Exactly. It's probably it's probably an easy way to think about it. Um you know, Sean, I uh, we're, we're coming up, so I want to respect your time. Um, but thank you for for having me on, and um, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you. And I, I look forward to for us to continue sharing. Uh, I don't think this will be the last conversation. I'd, I'd love to uh, test your product out and, and introduce you to ours, and and see where we can share inspiration and thoughts and and whatnot. And and yeah, I uh, I admire what you're doing. Thanks. I wanted to use your product, but it's not available in my country. Oh, interesting. Yeah, on oh, the App Store. You told, well, did you tell me this? I'm not sure. No. Uh, just if you, I'm going to end the recording in a minute and just stay on for a second. I'll, I'll talk to sure. you about it. Um, sure. So let me just, and how can people follow up with you? Yeah, so people can follow up with us. We, the, this app will be out in August. Um, so uh, you could 
download it when when the time comes and message me on this app. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you can find me on Twitter, um, either uh, through the this app's Twitter or Robbie Wade Six is is my Twitter. Um, also on Instagram um, as it's Robbie Wade. Um, but if you um, if if this app's of interest to you, jump over on the website, grab a username. Um, you can claim a username now and and sign up for the uh, release when it when it does come out. It will initially be invite only on on the app store so everyone who signed up early will be automatically invited to the initial rollout um so jump over there at thisapp.com t-h-i-s-a-p-p.com and yeah message me and I'll, I'll get back to you all right thank you very much robbie this has been fun talking about communication its present its potential future uh, opportunities and don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon not a sprint so take care of yourself every day and stay tuned for more video podcast episodes i love it i'm happy we're doing things in video now and if you want to join our entrepreneur community go to we live to build.com and you can get details for our discord there thank you robbie Thank you. Thank you for staying with us until the end of this episode. We know that you'll like the other two that are on the screen now. The one on the top right is the episode that we think you would benefit from by listening to next the most. And the one beneath it is what YouTube believes is also a really good choice for you. So thanks again for sticking with us and we hope to see you on the next video.